this day. If you're visiting with us, we are honored that you have chosen to spend your hour of worship with us, and so we hope that you will let us get to know you better. Introduce yourselves to us, please. Um, Melissa and I are leading today, and Kevin is off. Um, he's on baby watch. So, uh, yeah, just be in prayer for Lottie and the family this week as um, exciting things are coming. So let's pray together. Holy God of Easter, our resurrected Lord, we come once again, God, as your people to worship you and to lift our voices of praise, to open our hearts to your spirit, that we might hear your voice and understand your love and grace and mercy for each of us. In this hour, God, would you speak to us? Would you move among us? Be your glorious, resurrected self to us, that we might know you better. It is in your holy name that all God's children say, Amen.
as your spirit flows free let it find within me a heart that beats to praise you and now just to know you has become my As God is our audience, let us stand together and lift our voices in praise to him. Hymn number 360, Easter people, raise your voices. children to come forward and our boom whacker players you guys don't know what a treat you're in for we are going to make a very big circle today so can we make a very big circle yep everyone make a very big circle would you like one Jamie if you would like a boom whacker and you do not already have a boom whacker you are welcome to grab one boom whacker until we make sure everybody's got one. All right, would you like one of these ones? Do you want one of these ones? You want a green one? Like this one? Is this one kind of green? Aw. Like green one? Would you like this green one? All right, thank you. All right, Clayton, did you get one, buddy? Oh yeah, there we go. All right, everybody have one? All right, so you guys already laughed at these. Are these pretty funny? No? The adults might think they're funny. And some people are probably like walking in this morning going, why are there colorful sticks on the floor? Because some people don't even know what these are. You know what they are? What are they? They're from music, right. So last week we heard bells, right? If you were here, you watched online, you saw handbells play. Like this, yeah. These are hmm, the beginner bells. Because each one of these makes a different note. If I hit it on my head, this one's a G. It makes a note. Yeah, Silas has his too. 
right? What note does yours make? Do you know? What does it make? It makes a B, right? So we can make whole scales and whole songs with these. So first, we're going to let the youth who have been practicing a little bit play a song. And I want to know if you guys can guess what song it is, OK? All right. So youth, are you ready? Are you ready? All right. And if you're up here and you can read, you can't cheat. All right. All right. Know yet? Some people are getting it. You can sing if you get it. Yeah. Got one more verse. Try. In his hand. got it look the big kids did it too that's awesome so today because these are kind of silly aren't they people walk in and they're like oh ha, 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 ha. what are we doing those crazy kids it's holy humor Sunday you ever heard of holy humor Sunday no we're gonna talk about it more when we get to the sermon but holy humor Sunday it's a day when we celebrate joy right because I don't know about you, but when you guys come up here or I see you guys, a lot of times you're smiling or you're funny or you have funny things to say and you just embody joy, right? And joy is something that sometimes life is hard and it's hard to remember to be joyful. And you guys remind us that, you know what? We can have fun in all of it. And today, that's what our boom whackers are, is we're gonna have fun and make a joyful noise, okay? You guys ever heard that, a joyful noise? Sometimes we get so worried about trying to be perfect in everything we do, we forget to just do something. And so when we come to church, lifting our voices, it's not about how good our voice is, because like today, I don't even have one, right? But it's about us doing it to worship. So that's why everyone who's got a tube now, if you need to back up a little bit so you can see for the next song, you can. Um, so if we need to make our circle a little bit bigger so everyone can kind of see, even if you've not practiced with us before, you get to play with us. Because sometimes we just need to do it, right? Just have some joy and do it. So this one, I'm gonna tell you guys the words, okay? So this one is I've got peace like a river is the first verse. And I've got love like an ocean is the second verse. And joy like a fountain is the third verse. Okay, so I invite you to sing along with us as we make a joyful noise together playing some boom whackers. And if you know the motions, you're welcome to do the motions too. I'll be up here doing some motions too. Okay, are you ready? Is everybody ready? Okay, do I have the right one? It, that'd be helpful, wouldn't it? Okay, everyone ready? Okay. Yes, ready. Ready? I've got peace like a river. Thank you. 
amazing. Y'all are awesome. All right, so this week, I want you guys to remember those words in that song, right? We've got peace like a river, love like an ocean, and joy like a fountain in my soul. That I hope you can find joy in everything you do this week. Will you pray with me before we go back to our seats? Most holy God, we thank you that you give us the gift of joy, that you give us the gift of peace and love, that we may find joy in everything we do. So Lord, let us come to you with joy. Let us come to you with joy in trying new things. And Lord, let us make a joyful noise to you. In your most holy name we pray, amen. And so as adults, or everyone standing out there, let's stand and make a joyful noise together as we sing our next hymn. And children, if you will help me by giving me your boom whackers so we can put them away. Thank you. So I just want to take a moment and thank you all for your gifts and the ways you give and support this church because your gifts allow us to do things like get together and make a joyful noise with boom whackers. And that can be a really fun thing to do. We've had a lot of fun picking out songs or trying different pieces um, as we decided what we wanted to do this morning. And it's your gifts that make that possible. It's your gifts that make things like coming into worship possible, having heat in here, having flowers when we have flowers. It's your gifts that do all sorts of things. So thank you for that. Uh, as we come to the end of worship today, the generosity box this month is for our partnership with Renovation Alliance, specifically uh, helping sponsor some of the projects Impact Virginia will be doing when they're here in this area in July. Campers from all over the state will be working on local homes and helping local homeowners. So all your offerings to the generosity box at the end of worship throughout this month will help support that partnership. Will you pray with me? Most holy God, nothing we have is ours. Things we hold on to tightly come from you to begin with and we'll go back to you. So Lord, help us to keep that perspective, to remember that we are all part of your wonderful creation. 
Lord, help us to give gifts with joy. Help us to give of ourselves to try new things, to be part of the larger body of Christ and the work you are doing in this world, across the street and around the world. Lord, so take these gifts, bless, break, and multiply them that we may see others know your love and joy and peace. In your most holy name we pray. Amen.
Our scripture this morning from Genesis chapter 18. This is from uh, the message, uh, which is not a translation, but a uh, paraphrase. It's early for me. I'm not used to the morning. God appeared to Abraham at the Oaks of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance of his tent. It was the hottest part of the day, and he looked up and saw three men standing. He ran from his tent to greet them and bowed before them. He said, Master, if it please you, stop for a while with your servant. I'll get some water so you can wash your feet. Rest under this tree. I'll get some food to refresh you on your way, since your travels have brought you across my path. They said, certainly, go ahead. Abraham hurried to the tent to Sarah. He said, hurry, get three cups of our best flour, knead it and make bread. Then Abraham ran to the cattle pen and picked out a nice plump calf and gave it to the servant who lost no time getting it ready. When he got curds and milk, brought them with the calf that had been roasted, set the meal before the men and stood there under the tree while they ate. The men said to him, Where is Sarah your wife? He said, In the tent. One of them said, I'm coming back about this time next year. When I arrive, your wife Sarah will have a son. Sarah was listening at the tent opening just behind the man. Abraham and Sarah were old by this time, very old. Sarah was far past the age for having babies. Sarah laughed within herself. An old woman like me get pregnant with this old man of a husband? God said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Me, have a baby? An old woman like me? Is anything too hard for God? I'll be back about this time next year, and Sarah will have a baby. Sarah lied. She said, I didn't laugh, because she was afraid. But he said, Yes, you did. You laughed. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So throughout Lent, we asked questions. What do I fear? And who or what do I place my faith? What power will I surrender or do I need to surrender? What truth do I need to hear? And today I'll add a question to our Lenten questions. Who's laughing now? It's a different question than what we were asking throughout Lent, but it's apt for today because today is, as I mentioned earlier, Holy Humor Sunday. It is celebrated in many traditions the Sunday after Easter, and the reason for that is because it's the day we celebrate the joke that God played on the devil and the powers that be of the day. They thought they had won. They thought that this savior, the new king, the king of kings, who was coming to save the people of God, well, he was defeated. He was dead. Everything would be right in their world again because there was no longer a threat by this renegade leader who was healing on the Sabbath and flipping over tables in the temple. There was no threat from this growing group of disciples because now they had no leader. There was no threat to the religious leaders who were being questioned and told they were focusing on the wrong things and political leaders didn't need to worry anymore about potential unrest among the people because there was no threat. Death had put an end to it, a final, complete, unchangeable end. So the people had scattered even those who were closest to Jesus had denied him. One had turned him in. With no leader, there was no direction, and with no direction, there was no task. With no task, there was only going home, back to the lives they once knew, Roman oppression and all. And yet, on the third day, the unassuming women, there to care for the body, find an empty tomb, Stone rolled away and guards confused, only to turn around and find a gardener who wasn't a gardener at all. He's risen. 
death wasn't the victory that everyone thought. In fact, death was just another beginning for the ministry and work of Jesus and his followers. It was another beginning that we carry on today. Ha ha, God says, even when you think you have the final solution, the one no one can come back from, death was the victory that could not be taken away, but you're wrong. God is God, and God is all-powerful, and death cannot and will not win. And so, Holy Humor Sunday it is, a day where we celebrate joy in the face of whatever else may be going on around us, resurrection even from death. The custom itself goes all the way back, rooted in the early church theologians like Augustine, Gregory of Nyssa, and John Chrysostom. Rices Pascalis, the Easter laugh is what they called it. Some churches celebrate today by wearing the brightest colors they have. Bright Sunday, they call it, in contrast to the darkness of Lent and Good Friday. Critics of holy humor say, but faith is a serious matter. Do not laugh. Or this is irreverent. Many people come to church assuming we need to be serious. All matters of faith are to be handled without laughter or joy. And don't get me wrong, the faith you choose to base your life around is a big deal. It is a serious matter because for people around the world, choosing to be Christian, to follow the risen Savior, can be a matter of life and death. Your faith itself isn't a light matter. It's not an unserious matter. And yet, isn't it Jesus who welcomes the children to himself and says, receive the kingdom of God like children? And children are essentially the embodiment of joy so many times. So that means we can receive joy. We can come together and laugh and give thanks for what the Lord has done. We can rejoice in the good news. We can laugh. But we don't just laugh when something is funny or unexpected. We also often laugh when something is absurd. This kind of laughter happens a lot, especially when it comes from God telling us what God's going to do. Think back to the text that David just read for us. Sarah and Abraham are older. We're told that Sarah is well past her childbearing years. And yet God is here telling them that they're going to be, a par- they're going to be parents, the two of them, that Sarah's going to have a child. And when Sarah hears this, she laughs because this is not possible. She knows how the body works. Generations of women before her have taught her And she knows she's of an age where this is not possible. Not at all. She laughs. You know that scoff laugh? That yeah, right kind of laugh? And she's not the only one because the chapter before, when Abraham was told this, he too laughed. And he asked God, will a child be born to a man 100 years old? And Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? Mm. Y'all, I'm close to 40, and it's like, "Ah!" (laughs) See, in chapter 15, Abram had been told he would be the father of countless people, more than the stars in the sky, and eager for that to happen, even after Sarah had not born a child, Abram went with Sarah's maid, Hagar. So when God comes in chapters 17 and 18, Abram is like, but wait, I've got a son, Ishmael, with Hagar. Now you're saying 13, 14 years after that, that Sarah's going to have a child? And so they both laugh, both of them, because it's absurd. Sarah will not have a son until she does. And they name him Isaac, which means he laughs. Laughter. God can do the impossible. And then what's happening? Using my sanctified imagination, I can see God sitting back and saying to those around, can you believe they doubted? Can you believe they didn't believe I was going to do what I said I was going to do? So we come to the gospel text for this Sunday after Easter, and the story is Thomas. 
Now, many of you go, Doubting Thomas, we know that story. But we often overlook the fact that Thomas isn't the first to doubt. He just gets to take the heat for it. And his whole name gets revolved around his doubting. See, after the women find an empty tomb, they come across Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved, not named in John's version. But they don't believe the women, or maybe they just don't understand what they're saying, because they have to run to the tomb themselves and see that it's empty. But when they do that, they just go home. They don't even stick around to see what's happening. Mary is the one who sticks around and encounters the angels. Mary is the one who sticks around and sees the gardener just standing there. Mary is the one who goes to the disciples and tells them the good news, but they need to see Jesus too. They don't even believe. And so Jesus then comes and appears to them in the upper room where they're hiding out because they're scared. And there that he shows them his hands and his side, proving to them that it is him and he is risen. Thomas is the only one that isn't in the room. And so when he is approached by them, he asks for nothing less than they already received. To also see Jesus' hands and side, to see his wounds, to know that it is really him that's risen, because certainly, certainly he was like, no, he all didn't see Jesus. Proof or it didn't happen. I mean, they had heard Jesus say he was going to go from them and come back. They'd heard Jesus say the temple would be torn down and rebuilt in three days, because of course the temple can be torn down and rebuilt in three days. It's totally possible. And the women, Mary was basically probably hysterical when she came across Simon Peter. So, of course, she doesn't know what's going on. Ha, 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 there's no way that tomb is empty. But when they find it empty, let's just go home because this is all absurd. Can't even understand. Even when Mary comes back, I'm sure some people laughed at her. No, no, no. You didn't see him. We watched him die. Remember? And granted, when we talk about laughing in the Bible, people always go and talk about Sarah's laughter, right? You look up laughter in the Bible, it will always come up, Sarah laughed. But you know other people had to have laughed too. Noah, God, you want me to do what now? You want me to build a boat in the middle of the desert? Jonah, you want me to go and do what now where? Do you know who those people are? And you want me to give them a chance to repent? Moses turned to God and said, the people won't even listen to me. How's Pharaoh going to? When Saul was called to be king by Samuel, he hid among the baggage because what was being said was so absurd. I'm not doing that. When Jeremiah was called to be by God to bring a message to Israel, he said he couldn't do it because he was too young. Mary, when approached by angels, said, how can this be? When the angel came and told her she was going to have the Son of God, and Joseph, well, he was like, time to split up, I'm out. Not sure at all how any of this was going to work out. There are many people throughout the Bible who scoff laugh at Jesus, at God. (laughs) No. That's not going to happen. There are many people today who laugh. I wonder how many times we feel a pneuma nudge, as we call it, the spirit nudging us to do something, and we laugh. I can't do that. That's impossible. From big things to little things. I can't volunteer. Do you know how busy I am? I should reach out to that person on the prayer list, but do you see the schedule? I have too much to do today. I'll do it tomorrow. Then tomorrow comes, and tomorrow comes, and tomorrow comes. God is surely not asking me to be involved in the nursery. I'm too old for that. Mm Mm-hmm, yep. God is definitely not calling me to be a deacon, not even if I feel a nudge, not even if that nudge is the chair of deacons or the pastor. Not a nudge. 
God definitely doesn't want me to be a Sunday school teacher. Do you know what I know? Not enough. God doesn't want me to say yes to coming to this Bible study and say no to hanging out with my friends. God doesn't want me to say yes to going into ministry. God doesn't want me to think about moving somewhere new and establishing a community there. No. God surely won't use me because I'm not as strong as I once was. God surely isn't calling me to do anything because I don't have the money that they have. They can give. God doesn't want me to do that because I'm not smart enough. I don't even know how to do that. Surely that one's not for me. We laugh and scoff all the time because we think we know better than God. Could you see me doing that? No. We think we know that these things couldn't happen. Doesn't matter if there's a little nudge in our gut or our heart or our mind, wherever you feel yours. We're going to say no because there are plenty of completely logical reasons like Sarah had that things can't work out. She had completely, completely logical, scientific reasons to laugh. She was past her childbearing years. There was no way she was going to have a child. The disciples knew Jesus had died and that there is no coming back from that. Mary knew she hadn't been with, Jesus, with Joseph, and Joseph knew that society wasn't going to have all of this in their mess of a relationship and that splitting up was the better option. And yet I think about all the time the kids who go on trips and end up on roofs. I think about people who have never picked up a tool in their life learning how to put up cabinets after a house has been cleaned out due to flooding. I rebuilt a subfloor on a house, took out joists and put them back. Me. I think about people who learn to cook so there'll be food for the hungry. I think about people who start backyard gardens and they grow and grow. I think about nonprofits who start in someone's living room. I think about faithful people who show up week after week to teach Sunday school, even if and when they feel inadequate. I think about people who ran from their callings for decades, now serving as pastors and chaplains in unexpected places. I think about the ways we run and run and run, laughing at God saying, nope, you're funny. I mean, I was first called to ministry as a child, and then again in high school. And yet I went to college and then worked in another field, in another country, before I finally was like, when God called again, and said, okay, okay, now I'll go to seminary. Is anything impossible for God? I certainly thought so for a long time. I'm not good enough. Do you know what I've done in my life? Do you know what's in my brain? You want me to do what now? You want me to go where now? Why do we put limits on God's power? Because who's laughing now? Are we the ones sitting here laughing because God has said God is going to do something and we think God can't do it? Or I know God is sitting back waiting to be the one laughing, saying, told you if we will just say yes. So who's laughing now? Will you pray with me? Most holy God, why do we put limits on what you can do? We know it's because we're human and we're scared, we're nervous. Lord, we know that we fail and we are not enough. But Lord, we pray for you to show up in ways that remind us that we are enough, that you are enough, and you will give us what we need to do what you have asked. 
Lord, we are Easter people. We rejoice in the victory of the tomb, the empty tomb. Help us, Lord, to live and learn from the Jesus that walks among us, wounds and all, that says, look what I can do. Lord, help us in our unbelief. Lord, help us as we come to your table where we remember you. Remember what was done for us. And as we remember the getting up and walking out. In your most holy name we pray. Amen.
Jesus knew, sitting around that table, that he was sitting with fallible humans. He knew that some would be scared, that they wouldn't understand what was happening. He knew that they would scatter and run. And yet it's Jesus who sat there with them and said, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat. Jesus knew when he showed up in that upper room with them that they would think, we can't do this that they would need some proof, that they would need some gumption. Jesus knew what was going to come. Jesus knew that they could do it. Jesus knew that for centuries after, we would be saying, we do this in remembrance of him. So this morning, in all of our own unbelief, in all of our own wondering what's going to happen, we take and drink in remembrance of what Jesus has already done. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn together. As we go from this place, we go as imperfect people. We go as people who might laugh at what God is asking of us. But may we also go as people who say, why not? Willing to make a joyful noise with all of our attempts. Go and be the people of God. Amen. Amen.